Behind me is the guitar that the late Andre the Giant learned to play the guitar on. I'm kidding, that's not the guitar Andre, I'm just playing. You know, when I was a kid, there was an amusement park in Nashville, Tennessee called Opryland. And, uh, you know, some people thought it was pretty campy or, or pretty cheesy, but I actually thought it was a good amusement park. It was pretty cool. So the kids are out tonight. And what I mean by out is we've got one in college and we've got two enjoying their junior prom tonight. So Carolyn and I are sneaking up to Nashville. Nashville's about an hour and a half drive, but we wanted to take you along with us to see if we can get into Opry Mills, which is not Opry Land. And by the way, I miss Opry Land. I wish it was still there. But they replaced it with this big, huge shopping center that's interesting. It, I don't know. Get some film today. I'm going to talk about it and see what you think. In a quarter mile, turn left on Harrison Lane. Gonna have to edit all that out. I love going to Nashville. It's uh, an amazing city. So we made it from Chattanooga here to Opry Mills in about two hours. It took a little longer than we anticipated because traffic was kind of crazy between Chattanooga and Nashville, and it always is. I-24 is always weird. Anyway, we finally made it to Opry Mills, and where I'm standing right now used to be a theme park, and it was called Opryland. And no offense to the people here at Opry Mills, it's a great mall but it was much better as an amusement park. So yes, that parking lot in the mall that you're watching was a theme park at one time, and not some silly rinky-dink theme park, but one of the industry leaders of its time. And what many people either don't know or no longer care, and I say no longer care, because when Opryland closed, people from all over the country were pretty upset about it. Actually, outraged is a better term. And let me be clear, this really isn't about country music as much as you might think it is, because the Grand Old Opry wasn't just about country music. Early 20th century American music is complicated, but it isn't the topic of this video. But trust me, the Grand Old Opry is not a regional institution, but a pretty big part of American history. And by describing it as American, that means both the good and bad parts of American history. But again, that's not what this video is about. I make other videos dealing with the complexity of historical analysis, and very few people watch those videos. But if you're not familiar with the Grand Ole Opry, then you're probably not familiar with Opryland, and you may not understand why it's a pretty big mystery that a popular and financially successful theme park was demolished, and not even the company that demolished the theme park knows why. You can't make this stuff up. The Grand Ole Opry is a pretty big deal when it comes to mass communication and the tens of millions who are connected to the world through its broadcast. Long before television, Americans got their entertainment from the radio. The Grand Ole Opry Opry broadcasted on WSM known as The Legend. The Legend started broadcasting in 1925, but in 1932 it started broadcasting at 50,000 watts. And in case you didn't know it, that's a lot of wattage. In fact, on a clear night, one could listen to a radio broadcast of the Grand Ole Opry anywhere in the United States and even neighboring countries. This turned Nashville into an industry leader in producing recording artists, and eventually it became known as Music City USA. So yes, even if you hate country music, the Grand Ole Opry is a big deal. But before we get started into this interesting mystery, let me just say a few words. If you're a subscriber to my channel here on YouTube, or a follower on Vidme, I just want to say welcome back. And if you're new to A Nose for Life, I extend a warm welcome to you as well. I want to encourage you to hit the like button or the upvote button as you're watching this video to let me know that you're at least somewhat interested in the content we're creating just for you. And I hope that you'll consider subscribing to my channel or following the channel on Vidme. And if you're on both Vidme and YouTube, and if you have time to subscribe to both, that helps a great deal. We're building a very unique content community, and when you subscribe and request notifications it helps us grow so thank you in advance this video is about the mysterious disappearance of the forgotten theme park Opryland but here's some cool things that I did find here in the parking lot so the electric car thing I don't know if you have one if you do I'd love to hear about it in the comments below I've always been a little scared of the electric car just because I can see myself as one of those guys that forgets to charge his car in the morning or something then you go to pull out and you go to work and then you can't get to work because you forgot to charge a car and why do I think I would do that because I do that to my phone all the time and you know when you do that to your phone it's fine because you can 
plug it into your car, but if your car has run out of charge, you've got nothing to plug your phone into and you're just stuck. It's just kind of crazy. But I'm not used to seeing these around where we live there in Hickson and Chattanooga area. I don't see a lot of these. If I don't even know where one's located. If you do, I'd love to hear about it in the comments uh, down below because I, I don't see these everywhere. It's on a paying basis. So it, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I keep thinking that maybe an electric car would save you money. But I don't see how it would save you money when you still got to possibly pull up and charge somewhere. He doesn't say anything about like how much it costs to charge your car per hour or anything like that. It just has this little credit card swipey thing. It's like imagination pay. What do you want to pay to charge your car? I don't think it says that at all. Maybe, maybe when you swipe your card, it comes up. I'm not sure. I don't have an electric car. But this is kind of cool to have. And if, if that's the direction we're going as a society towards electrical cars, even though I don't think that's a good idea right now, but let's say that is where we end up. Great. That's wonderful. And this is kind of a cool concept. So it's like a charging station, but instead of for your phone, it's for your car. But it's still not Opryland. Opryland USA, the theme park, opened in 1970 as a part of the Grand Ole Opry's relocation and expansion project. The expansion was due at least in part to the increasing popularity of country music during the 1960s, America's love for nostalgia, and that country music was no longer considered a genre of music that was only appreciated regionally, meaning that by the 1960s, country music was carving itself out a slice of the popular culture. Rock and roll was not birthed in country music, but most Americans were introduced to rock and roll through country music artists with only a handful of exceptions. Now there's a lot more to that story, and it's complicated and controversial and full of drama. Even today, defining country music can start a fight. Country music has never been unified under one sound or style or public persona, but there were a lot of power struggles to establish an official sound, style, or public persona or public image. This hampers Music City to this very day, but that's for another time. By the 1960s, the Grand Ole Opry was much more than a radio program. It was, and still is, an iconic symbol for millions of Americans. Some of the biggest recording artists in history were rocking out at the Ryman Auditorium and on the Grand Ole Opry. So people traveled from all over the U.S. to be a part of the studio audience for the Grand Ole Opry at the Ryman Auditorium in downtown Nashville, Tennessee. And by this time, Nashville was well established as Music City, USA. But also, during the late 1960s, the city of Nashville was growing rapidly and the Grand Ole Opry needed a new home, but they did a lot more than just relocate. They built a new auditorium, hotel, and convention center, and of course, the theme park. And the theme park was a huge success. Opryland USA was a pretty big deal throughout the 1970s, 1980s, and well into the 1990s, attracting over 2 million visitors annually. Well into the 1990s, even the year it closed, Opryland was successful and profitable. Now, there were some issues by the 1980s, but keep in mind, none of these issues were impossible to fix. Moreover, these issues never affected the profitability or popularity of the theme park. So, Opry Mills is also home to the Grand Ole Opry, the longest running radio broadcast ever. If you know anything about country music, or maybe even music at all, you know that, well, it was the Grand Ole Opry that kind of put country music on the map. Millions of people from all over the United States tuned in to listen to their favorite country or gospel artists here in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even now to hear them sing and do their thing on the Grand Ole Opry. But this isn't actually the home of the original Grand Ole Opry. This is sort of the upscale, modern version of the Grand Ole Opry, and you can go in here and see shows and be entertained by all kinds of awesome, amazing artists. But it still is an Opryland, and I miss Opryland. Opry Mills has a lot of stores and a lot of things that you probably don't have at normal malls. It's sort of eccentric that way. Malls all over the U.S. have closed down. There's an awesome YouTube channel. This guy's a genius too. He's covering all of the malls that have actually closed down over the past 10 years. People don't go to malls like they used to. Some of it has to do with the economy. And some of it has to do with things just change. Generally speaking, Opryland was not operated as an independent business. It was bundled together with other business ventures. I'm not going to try to say that this is complicated because it's really not, but it's too long for the video. To make a long story short, corporate entities were interested in businesses connected with Opryland, but they weren't that interested in Opryland itself. This is mystery number one. Why? And that's why it's a mystery. We don't know. We don't know why they weren't interested in Opryland. Later, Opryland was sold to Gaylord Entertainment, who made the decision to close and demolish the theme park and build a mall. But this 
is mystery number two, and it's downright insane, and I'll explain why. Locally, it's always been assumed that Gaylord Entertainment made the decision to close Opryland because of declining ticket sales due to the opening of Kentucky Kingdom, which is a few hours north of Nashville, and the opening of Dollywood, which is a couple of hours east of Nashville. But this simply isn't the case, and there's no evidence at all that Kentucky Kingdom or Dollywood had anything to do with Opryland's closing. Even though I'm one of the millions of people who accepted this as fact, it's simply illogical and not true. Opryland was an established brand. Kentucky Kingdom was brand new and so was Dollywood. Now make no mistake, Dollywood is a major player in the theme park business these days. In fact, one of my first videos is about Dollywood and I'll link to that video at the end of this video. But back when Dollywood first opened, I assure you, there was no guarantee it would be a success. Many people, including people here in the state of Tennessee, assumed that Dollywood would be a flop. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, I assumed it was going to flop too. I was wrong, and I'm happy to be wrong because I love Dollywood and I highly recommend a visit. Nevertheless, Dollywood, especially when it opened, was not a threat to Opryland any more than Six Flags over Georgia in Atlanta is a threat to Dollywood today. So I'm here at the entrance of Opry Mills. I don't know how much they're going to let me videotape in here because, uh, you know, stores and stuff, but still, for a Saturday night, there's not a lot of people here. Granted, they're going to be closing soon and, and all that, probably here in just, just the next little while, but still not a lot of people here. The main issue that faced Opryland was expansion. You won't notice this by looking at a theme park map, but from what I can find with public access, Opryland's property lines are sort of shaped like a triangle. The Cumberland River was on one side of the property, and Briley Parkway, a main traffic artery of Nashville, was on the other side. Opryland was trapped with no possibility to expand its borders on any side. So in order to bring in new rides, they had to take down old rides, and that's never a good growth model. Ask Disney about removing rides. People get attached to rides and attractions, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's a good thing unless you're trying to attract new customers who want bigger, faster, or more entertaining attractions. Theme park attraction diversity is extremely important. And if a theme park can't expand, the ability to attract new guests is restricted. Speaking of Disneyland, Walt Disney ran into the same problem in the 1960s in California, which is why he moved his future ideas to the swamps of Florida. The lack of real estate can really hinder growth of theme parks. The inability to expand is not a reason to shut a theme park down. And besides, it's never mentioned as a reason why Opryland was closed. Back in the 80s, it was all about going to the mall. I mean, I remember as a kid, there was nothing better than having a roll full of, full of quarters. Mom and dad's going to the mall, and you hope that your friends would meet you at the arcade. It was good times. The 80s are over. And I can remember even by the early 90s and mid 90s, malls were not necessarily a place everybody wanted to go to anymore anyway. But whatever fad, you know, ended, the internet definitely killed malls in general. And Opry Mills is one of those great malls, still standing, still in operation. It still seems to be doing okay, but let's just face it, the internet has killed the day at the mall, for the most part. I mean, people still go to the mall, don't get me wrong, but the mall isn't like it was 20 years ago. Listen, if you disagree, I'd love to hear what you have to think. Tell me in the comments. So every time I'm at a mall and it's like about to close or maybe it's just about to open, which again, that isn't often because who goes to the mall a lot anymore? But every time I think about this 1980s zombie movie, now that zombies are so in vogue, I mean, I think they're so in vogue that they're about to go out of style. But anyway, it was one of those Night of the Living Dead, part of that whole genre of zombie movies and these people were like holding out against the zombies at a mall. Do you remember that one? If you do, I would love to hear about that in the comments because I don't remember the name of it, but they had to hold out in the mall. And I remember thinking as a kid, how cool it would be like if you had to make your last stand at a mall. There's even a scene where they're like trying on clothes and stuff and there's like mall music playing. But every time I see an empty mall now, I think about that moment in that movie, the zombie apocalypse. Now here's mystery number three. So let's say you're demolishing an established theme park to build a mall because it's your business and you can do whatever you like. Maybe because it's all about the cash. Okay, I get that. Even if I don't like it sometimes, that's just how business works. But as a business decision, large shopping malls were already on the decline by the mid-1990s. I state the following with no intended disrespect. Many people dismiss this decline, stating that what really hurt the American mall were the events on September 11th and increasing local security incidents, and naturally, the internet, and of course that last one's a no-brainer. 
But those reasons don't quite add up on a timeline. People forget that we were in a recession prior to the events of September 11th and prior to the explosion of internet purchasing or buying stuff on the internet. The bottom line is that building a mall in the mid to late 1990s was risky. And many argue that if you built a mall in the 1990s, you probably weren't paying attention to the trends. Maybe Gaylord Entertainment simply made a business miscalculation. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure Opry Mills makes a little money occasionally. In preparing this video, I tried to find that information, but I ran into a dead end. And now I'm out of time to continue my search, but here's a fact, Opry Mills is probably following the same trend as every other retail-oriented business that chew their fingernails every quarter these days. And it's probable that Opryland, having an established name and legacy, would have remained consistent. Now, when I was thinking about doing this video, I almost chickened out because I figured that I had to be missing something, but I kept digging and kept reading and I found Mystery 4. So in 2004, having received a lot of questions and criticism about the closure of Opryland, Gaylord Entertainment, who was then under all new management, released a statement that I'm going to paraphrase here. After looking into the matter, they found no reason for the closure of Opryland. Yes, you heard me right. They found no reason for the closure of Opryland. The links will be in the description. I really want to understand that comment. That they found no reason that the prior leadership closed Opryland is to say that there was some kind of takeover and the new management has no idea why decisions were made to bring them to a certain point in time? What am I missing here? In fact, there's more to this statement that seems to indicate that they couldn't even locate a business analysis or a study, anything, that prompted the decision to close the successful theme park and open a shopping mall. And here's the cherry on top. In 2012, Gaylord CEO Colin Reed said that closing Opryland was a, quote, bad idea. So it works like this, same company, new management, and not a single document pertaining to a study, evaluation, smoking gun, or anything that could be found to justify Opryland's closure. It was just an idea. And it turns out, it was a bad idea. So if you're ever asked why Opryland was closed, you can just say, it was an idea someone had. So what was the real reason Opryland was demolished? Well, no one knows the real reason, but at least we can clear up some misconceptions. If you heard that tickets were declining, that's not exactly true. I mean, it is true, but only during the last year when the announcement came that the park was closing. If you heard Opryland close because of Dollywood or another theme park, well, that's not true either. And seriously, if you've stuck around to the end of this video, <laughs> I'm as shocked as you probably are right now, and I challenge you to go a Googling to fact check me on any of this. You'll run into blogs, quoting rumors, and downright lies from publicity firms. But the absolute fact is that the company that did the demolishing came right out and said it. We don't know why we did it. That, you see that behind me right there? That is so cool, I don't even know what it is, I gotta go look at it. Hey, I would totally ride this stuffed animal through the mall, I'm not kidding. If they don't have ages on this and this place was open, I would so ride those stuffed animals, that would be so cool. I'm just saying. Hey, I'm just curious, has anyone actually ever used one of these? I, I've never used one because they, they scare me. I mean, how do they know what kind of rubbing you like? They don't, they don't know. This thing could be dangerous. It's like a lawsuit waiting to happen. You ever use one of these? Tell me what you think about them. Dollywood is host to 2.5 million guests per year. As much as I love Dollywood, let's face it, Dollywood has a great location advantage and gets some runoff from the 10 million people who visit the Smoky Mountains that are practically next door to Dollywood every single year. Opryland was putting up the same numbers in Nashville, Tennessee in the 1980s. Now, listen, I love Nashville. I love Tennessee for that matter. But we're in the South, middle of the country, in the middle of nowhere, kind of. And yes, Nashville is even a bigger city now. But these days, you can't really compare Nashville to other Southern cities. It's quite unique. But to think that millions of people came from all over the U.S. to visit Opryland? Well, I would have loved to have been at the business meetings when the decision was made to close Opryland. I just want to know how it happened. Oh wait, you can't know how it happened because no one knows how it happened. Are they serious? And if they are serious, what does that exactly mean? So as far as malls go, 
Opry Mills is amazing. If you're ever in the Nashville area, I highly recommend stopping by Opry Mills. You'll need, you'll need four or five hours. I mean, the shopping is amazing. There's lots to do. I mean, a lot to do. I mean, even going to the movies there is a pretty big adventure. But it's not Opryland. I want to give a special thanks to Derek Fugit, who allowed me to use his personal family footage of his Opryland trips. And you can see those right here on YouTube. In fact, on your screen right now is Derek's YouTube page. Check it out. Subscribe to his channel. Don't just go to his channel and go through his stuff and leave. Subscribe to his channel. Hit that like button and tell Derek I sent you. I greatly appreciate that. I'm telling you, it's amazing. Check it out. If you love Opryland, I would love to hear about it in the comments. And I just want to tell you that I'm thankful for you watching this video. This was a longer video, especially for YouTube these days. And I'm very grateful that you watched. I hope that you'll click that like button and hit, hit the subscribe button as well. And if you're on Bidney, I hope that you'll follow and share this channel. And thank you again for watching. I'm Bill Marion, and this is A Nose for Life. So yeah, this is what Carol and I are doing while our movie, well, before our movie starts. And again, it was sort of a spontaneous trip, uh, to say the least, because we're hungry and all the restaurants are closed. This is bound to be worth a Google, but the guitar behind me is obviously a Fender Telecaster. And I'm thinking that it was probably, this is probably supposed to be the guitar that was used in Johnny Cash's band. I'm just thinking, I'm gonna ask my dad about that. He's a guitar expert. If you know the answer, put it in the comments below, but I'm pretty sure that that's supposed to be like the giant version of the guitar that you get that certain sound that Johnny Cash music has. I don't know, we'll have to look into that one. So, Opry Mills is not exactly kicking the night. I mean, the security guards aren't gonna have a hard time kicking people out of here, you know what I'm saying?